Tears rolled down my cheeks, but not because of fear or rage, but because my impending death is caused only by the love and compassion I have wished to deploy onto all creatures, by my displeasure against abuse and injustice, and by my eagerness to close the gap between rich and poor, between free men and slaves, and between natives of Kemi and foreigners. Death comes and I do not have a single friend by my side, no one to accompany me or to comfort me, as defending me against this horde of fanatics would be an impossibility. My final goodbye does not cause me fear. However, murderous blind hatred does disturb me, hurts me and shakes every fiber of my being like a storm. I know there is still a way to outwit fate. My bedroom has a back exit, so I could escape, but I will not. I do not wish to flee from death, but to embrace it. The door is about to give way under the axe blows. I finally see its sharp edge peeling through splinters and everybody and every blow sinks forever deeper into my heart. Each beat is like a small death, because what kills me is not the sword nor the axe, but hate, so that before I receive the blow I am already dead. I will not ask for mercy, I will not retreat or nor show the terror that they expect to see. On the contrary, I will defiantly open my tunic, inviting the assassins to do what they have come to do, whilst forgiving them and blessing them. No matter what happens, everything is well and is as it should be. But above all, I am serene because I learned that this horrible way to end my days is not the result of chance or injustice, is not even the consequence of my actions. It is rather the decision that I myself, my own soul, had already taken before being born. I die today, but the seed is sown. My work leaves will grow and will change the face of the earth. This is my story. When light was first created and the land of Kemi was illuminated with it, I did not know yet that that same day would mark the rest of my life, expose it to adventure, to suffering and happiness. I did not know that the adventure that was about to begin would change me deeply, would change the land of Kemi and end up changing everything Ra reaches with his rays. At that moment, oblivious to the upcoming convulsions, I would only pay attention to one thing. I opened my eyes and immediately the melancholy pulled me and then softly pushed me down the bottom of a pit at once dark and vibrant. Before my eyes I had a coffered ceiling covered with gold leaf, but I could not see it. I was allowing myself to be gently rocked by the sadness of a feeling that, if feelings had a smell, would give off the sweet aroma of near rotten things. I was not surprised to notice tears burning my cheeks, neither was I surprised to find myself trapped in the intense beauty of that grief. Another night. Once again, the young and beautiful stranger, thin and pale, with a skin so white that was almost transparent, had returned to visit my dreams. She had again come to envelop me in her warm embrace and to make me feel an almost physical shudder for the purest of loves. I had nevertheless experienced physical and real pleasure, not imagined, every night since first of Shemu. And the dream, when I awoke, always gave me the sad knowledge that it was not real. It had never been. 
it was nothing more than a projection of my own mind and the expression of my inner emptiness. That's why every night I slipped into bed with a mixture of joy and fear. The former because I knew the girl would come back to me under the dim and dark glow of the stars. The latter because I knew it would disappear with the pink light of dawn. I could never see her face, not one single night. In my dream we embraced and my heart burst with more tenderness than I ever thought possible, but I could not see her eyes. However, I had the certainty she was more beautiful than I could ever imagine. True, I loved something that never existed. It may seem gauche or nonsensical, but that turbulent world of ideas and chimeras was my world, because I loved ideas and despised things. Things could be spoiled and corrupted, but ideas were not subject to limits or ends, and I could mould them to the liking of my imagination. Both were perfect, like my secret girl of the early mornings, who made my musings I named by bright of stars. She was also an idea, or rather a feeling, and I knew that she would never take form, that I would never kiss her lips or look into the depths of her eyes, because real life, that is, the immense world that existed outside my mind, was futile and disappointing. As long as I did not break the limits of my night dream, the girl would remain unblemished and her love would remain intense and pure as a burning flame. My bride of stars, although a source of relentless touching the very foundations of my personality, had also become a soothing bulb for me. The reason was simple. Anxiety was not an option in my upbringing. My father was a great Amenhotep, nicknamed the Magnificent, and whose crowning name had been Nebmat Ra. He was the god, the mighty bull, the living Horus. I, I suppose, lived happily with my family in the house of gold, called the Tassel of Aten, the shining palace on the western shore of the river Aetero. This palace, which in daytime marvelled both princes and villains, was by night transformed into a miraculous constellation of glowworms whose light was majestically reflected on the calm waters of the river. Like every month, the moon had regained the shape of a silver boat and stood motionless in the eastern sky. Heavy violet clouds laid lazily on the opposite horizon where blessed souls lived in perfect happiness. Crickets, less can army more numerous than the stars in the firmament, murmured from the remote cane fields. I could hear the sound, soft and smooth, beyond the dark depths of the Aetero. Unfortunately, I could only imagine such landscape for the house of gold was more like a golden cage for me, and from my chambers I could only see the diffused darkness. It was true that I was not imprisoned, but yet I was, because I could barely get out of the immense, marvellous and admirable palace of the Dassel of Aten, also called Per Hay, the house of joy. Sometimes I was allowed to play by the large artificial lake enclosed inside the grounds of the palace, but that was all I could do without control or surveillance. What can you wish for when you are the son of Neb? What on earth and in heaven can you not get by just clicking your fingers? This was the paradox with which I was forced to live. Everything was allowed to me and everything was within my reach, except my own longings. Soon I would be appointed chief of the king's scribes, priest of some temple or something similar, and that was all. 
The other boys of my age had plans and ambitions, and in their lives there was a place for uncertainty, even if it was a modest one. Of course, the youngsters who surrounded me belonged only to the most select families and, as adults, would end up in high office, in the high magistrates of the state. But even so, their fate was not completely written and locked like mine was. My life, the life of a privileged among the privileged, was decided beforehand. The fat, proud and authoritative priests of Amon educated me with dedication and patience, and these included not only a very demanding and academic schooling, but also discipline and, above all, renunciation. Renunciation to what seemed to me the most elementary of necessary for a boy of my age, to leave the house of gold, I mean, to leave without company or protocol, to find out what the vast, varied and unsuspected world beyond, meet other people and smell other smells, even if they were not pleasant, because the fragrances of the palace were as select as they were tedious. I did not care that the real world may offer me not only promises but also setbacks and threats. I wanted and needed to be surprised by new. And then I realized that my own thoughts surprised me. I, the idealist lover of perfection, attracted by the different, the vulgar, the poor, the ugly and deformed. It was a new facet of my personality that even I didn't know. Suddenly, during my most intense thoughts, I felt a strong flash in my mind and from its depths I clearly heard one single word. Now! I was stunned for a few moments, but then a group of swallows crossed the sky swiftly next to me. I knew it was a signal and I had no doubt what I should do. I hurried out of my royal quarters and won the inner court, an immense and open space where the only sign of life were three old soldiers, not very sober, who entertained themselves with board games in a secluded corner under the dim light of a lamp. The food and weapon stores and the workshops of perfumers, carpenters, goldsmiths and other craftsmen were around the court. But I was looking for a very specific store, the birders. I located it in the thick darkness. I lit an oil lamp, shoved open the door, wooden floor, oh. shoved open the poor wooden door, which was only just jumped esto mejor no.